A well-thought-out story doesn't need to resemble real life. Life itself tries with all its might to resemble a well-crafted story. Good evening, friends, and welcome once again to Storytime for Adults. Stories post the fourth Monday of every month. Well, it's November. Winter appears to be almost upon us as the year starts to draw towards a close. For most of this year, we've had some sort of seasonal or holiday or observational tie-in. Uh, this month, however, I decided to do something a little bit different. This month, we're going to examine an author that most of us have probably never heard of, but coming from a country that we've already seen, but at a radically different time in its history. Tonight's author also comes from a community that we have seen slightly represented, but not really highlighted. Okay, so that was pretty cryptic, I know. And you're probably curious what exactly I'm going on about. Well, let me tell you. A Russian writer, playwright, journalist, and polyglot translator, Isaac Babel has been called the greatest prose writer of Russian Jewry. He was also imprisoned, unpersoned, and executed by the Soviet Interior Ministry on political charges that were ultimately revealed to be entirely fabricated. I'll note before going on that I will be attempting to pronounce a rather large number of Russian, Ukrainian, and Ashkenazi Jewish names, and I will undoubtedly get something wrong. I apologize in advance. I'm doing my best. So, Isaac Emanuelovich Babel was born July 13th, 1894, in the Moldavanka district of the city of Odessa, then in the Russian Empire, present-day Ukraine, to Manas and Fegia Babel. Shortly after his birth, the family moved away from Odessa, but returned in 1906, when Isaac was 12. This time they lived in a more fashionable district of Odessa, but Moldavanka seems to have held a lifelong fascination for Babel, and some of his plays, as well as his book, Odessa Stories, are set largely in that district. Babel's family growing up was well off. His father owned a warehouse and was a major dealer in farming implements. Babel, however, always chose to portray his family as deeply impoverished, and his father described simply as a shopkeeper. At first, what might conclude that Isaac Babel invented this impoverished, difficult childhood as a way to add mystique or hardship to his own autobiography or for social credit. This does not appear to have been his motivation at all, however. By the time Isaac Babel was writing his autobiography, he was no longer living in Imperial Russia, but in the Soviet Union. And at that time, being known or perceived as having come from privilege or the middle class or the bourgeoisie, could not just be professionally crippling, but could put a person in active danger, especially someone who is an, observ an observant Jew and notably not a member of the Communist Party. And during his teenage years, Isaac wanted to attend the Nicholas I Odessa Commercial School. In addition to passing the entrance exam, however, he also had to overcome the Jewish quota. Jewish quotas were discriminatory policies common in developed countries all over the world in the 19th and early 20th centuries, designed to limit or deny access to Jews to important institutions, especially educational ones. Isaac passed the tests, but his place was taken by someone else, and his parents' response was to have him privately tutored at home. That salient fact should give you an idea of exactly how impoverished his family growing up was. Later in life, uh, his attempts to enroll at Odessa University would also end up being blocked on ethnic grounds. This resulted in him eventually entering the Kiev Institute of Finance and Business, where he would eventually meet his wife, Eugenia Borisovna Gronfein. In 1915, after graduation, uh, Babel would move to Petrograd, that's modern day St. Petersburg. Now doing so was in direct defiance of the czarist law at the time called the Pale of Settlement. What it essentially meant was that if you were Jewish, you were limited within the Russian Empire to a specific section of the Western Empire in which you were allowed to live. The Pale itself would be abolished in 1917 after the start of the Bolshevik Revolution and eventual Ru Russian Civil War that eventually led to the creation of the Soviet Union. But the Pale had ceased being actively enforced in 1914 with the outbreak of the First World War. And while in Petrograd, Babel would meet the author Maxim Gorky was himself nominated for the Nobel Prize in Literature five times. 
but Gorky would eventually publish several of Babel's early short stories and advised him to improve his writing by gaining more life experience. In 1917, Babel was working in, as a newspaper reporter, a job that started to give him that life experience and would introduce him to classes and types of people who would come back to his writing for the rest of his life. In 1920, however, Isaac Babel took an assignment to write as a war correspondent following the Soviet Red Cavalry during the beginning of the Russian Civil War. His diaries from this time led to him drafting the book of short stories titled Red Cavalry. It's clear from his writing how deeply disturbing and uncomfortable this assignment was for him. Allow me to put it in some sort of context. The Red Cavalry were made up of Cossacks, and no offense to Cossacks here, but randomly raiding and killing Jews was significantly more than a common pastime for them. The Red Cavalry at that time was also operating exclusively within the Pale of Settlement, where a sizable portion of the population were Jews. And this was a civil war. It would have taken an iron backbone and a real commitment to do that job. The stories found in Red Cavalry are all short, and once read, they will tend to stick with you in a way that it is hard to describe. In these stories, Babel also utilizes the sort of economy of language common to Russian literature that we discussed in January with Pushkin. While in Red Cavalry, Babel writes in a matter of fact manner that makes Ernest Hemingway seem to be positively chatty. Sometimes writing in just a handful of pages, stories and events that Shakespeare would have devoted entire plays to. And the thing is, his stories lose exactly none of their punch or impact for being short. There are four page stories in that collection that hit hard enough to take your breath away and leave you speechless, being even more powerful for knowing that they were based on events that he personally witnessed. Red Cavalry itself was, of course, anything but revolutionary war propaganda, and the book earned him a plethora of powerful enemies, including Simon Budioni, the general who led the detachment that he followed. Budioni was so incensed that he went so far as to demand Babel's summary execution. Gorky, however, was not only able to protect Babel because of his status, but to see Red Cavalry published. Now, I'm going to gloss over quite a lot of details of Babel's personal life here because we're already running long and there are some important bits that we need to get to. Suffice to say that Babel was often not faithful to his wife and had numerous affairs. Infuriated by this, his wife eventually emigrated to France and left him in 1925. They would reconcile for a short time in France and have a daughter, Natalie, but Babel was never able to convince his wife to return to Russia with him. As a result, by 1934, he was living in Moscow with another woman, Antonina Pizikova. By 1939, their now common-law marriage produced a daughter named Lydia. On May 15, 1939, however, Babel was arrested by NKVD agents outside Moscow. He was driven to the infamous Lubyanka prison in Moscow, with Antonina in the car as well. That morning would mark the last time that anyone outside the Soviet security and police apparatus would see Isaac Babel. He was accused of being a spy and a Trotskyite, among other things, none of which were true. From the moment he entered the prison, he was effectively made to be a non-person. His name disappeared from official records and school syllabi. He was widely taught and beloved in the Soviet Union at the time. His entries disappeared from literary encyclopedias and dictionaries. Official mentions of him ceased and disappeared. His name was removed from works that he'd collaborated on. And private mentions of him or inquiries about his whereabouts with authorities put one at very real risk. During his time in Lubyanka prison, he was tortured repeatedly and as a result made false confessions and accusations that he later recanted. On orders from Joseph Stalin, issued on January 16, 1940, 154 prisoners were individually tried. Babel's trial took place in chambers, <clears throat> and it was all of 20 minutes long. The verdict had already been decided. He would be executed by firing squad immediately. On Janu January 27, 1940, at 1.30 a.m., he was shot and buried in a mass grave. Babel was essentially erased from Russia and the face of Russian literature with his arrest. Fourteen years later, in 1954, during the Khrushchev Thaw, a period of relaxation of censorship and repression, during which millions of prisoners, including Alexander Solzhenitsyn, the author of the Gulag Archipelago, were uh, released from gulags, an official statement was made that read, 
the sentence of the military collegium, dated 26 January 1940, concerning Babel, i.e., is revoked on the basis of newly discovered circumstances in the case against him is terminated in the absence of elements of a crime. And with that sentence, Babel's works became widely published and available in his homeland again, though it would not be until 2002 when all of his complete works were finally published in Russia in Russian. Babel was also known for writing about Odessa, his home city, and particularly of the Jewish people, and especially the Jewish gangsters that lived there. So tonight we'll be reading uh, the very first of his Odessa stories, The King, about the fictional Jewish gangster Benya Kirk, or Crick. And we will also be reading a letter from Red Cavalry. Oh, I've gone on more than long enough, so let us begin if we can. The King by Isaac Babel. Oh, and I should mention, uh, The King, the story was published in 1924. The wedding ceremony ended. The rabbi sank into a chair. Then he left the room and saw tables lined up the whole length of the courtyard. There were so many of them that the ends stuck out of the gates into Gaspatalnia Street. The tables, draped in velvet, coiled through the yard like a snake, on whose belly patches of every color had been daubed and these orange and red velvet patches sang in deep voices. The rooms had been turned into kitchens. A rich flame, a drunk plump flame, forced its way through the smoke-blackened doors. Little old women's faces, wobbly women's chins, beslobbered breasts baked in the flame's smoky rays. Sweet, red as blood, pink as the foam of a rabbit dog, dripping from these blobs of rampant, sweet-odored human flesh. Three cooks, not counting the scullery maids, prepared the wedding feast, and over them, eighty-year-old Razel reigned, traditional as a Torah scroll, tiny and hunchbacked. Before the feast began, a young man, unknown to the guests, wormed his way into the courtyard. He asked for Benya Crick. He took Benya Crick aside. Listen, king, the young man said, I have a couple of words I need to tell you. Aunt Hannah from Kostetskaya Street, she sent me. So, Binya Crick, nicknamed the king, answered. So what's these couple of words? And Hannah, she sent me to tell you that a new police chief took over at the police station yesterday. I've known that since the day before yesterday, Binya Crick answered. Well, the chief of police called the whole station together and gave a speech. A new broom is always eager to sweep, Binya Crick answered. He wants a raid. So, but when does he want to raid, king? Do you know that? Tomorrow. King, it's going to be today. Who told you that, boy? Aunt Hannah, she said so. You know Aunt Hannah. I know Aunt Hannah. So? The chief called the whole station together and gave them a speech. We must finish off Benya Crick, he said, because when you have his majesty the czar, you can't have a king too. Today, when Crick gives away his sister in marriage, and they will all be there, is when we raid. So? Then the stool pigeons began to get worried. They said, if we raid them today during his feast, Benya will get angry and a lot of blood will flow. But the chief said, our self-respect is more important to me. Good, you can go, the king said. So what do I tell Aunt Hannah about the raid? Tell her Benya, he knows from the raid. And the young man left. Three or four of Benya's friends followed him. They said they would be back in about half an hour. And they were back in half an hour. That was that. At the table, the guests did not sit in order of seniority. Foolish old age is just as pitiful as cowardly youth. Nor in order of wealth. The lining of a heavy money bag is sown with tears. The bride and groom sat at the table's place of honor. It was their day. Beside them sat Sender Eichbaum, the king's father-in-law. That was his due. You should know the story of Sender Eichbaum because it's a story definitely worth knowing. How did Benya Crick, gangster and king of gangsters, make himself Eichbaum's son-in-law? How did he make himself the son-in-law of a man who owned one milk cow short of 60? It all had to do with a robbery. A year or so earlier, Benya had written a letter to Eichbaum. Monsieur Eichbaum, he wrote, I would be grateful if you could place 20,000 rubles by the gate of number 17. 
Sofiaskaya Street tomorrow morning. If you do not, then something awaits you, the likes of which has never been seen her been se has never before been heard, and you will be the talk of all Odessa. Sincerely yours, Benya the King. Three letters, much clearer than the one before, remained unanswered. Then Benya took action. They came by night, ten men carrying long sticks. The sticks were wound with tarred oakum. Nine burning stars flared up in Eichbaum's cattle yard. Benya smashed the barn's locks and started leading the cows out one by one. They were met by a man with a knife. He felled the cows with one slash and plunged his knife into their hearts. On the ground, drenched with blood, the torches blossomed like fiery roses, and shots rang out. The dairymaids came running to the cowshed, and Benya chased them away with shots. And right after him, other gangsters began shooting into the air, because if you don't shoot into the air, you might kill someone. And then, as the sixth cow fell with a death bellow at the king's feet, it was then that Eichbaum came running out into the courtyard in his underpants. Benya, where will this end? he cried. If I don't have the money, you don't have the cows, Mr. Eichbaum. Two and two make four. Benya, come into my house. And inside the house, they came into an agreement. They divided the slaughtered cows between them. Eichbaum was promised immunity and given a certificate with a stamp to that effect. But the miracle came later. At the time of the attack, that terrible night when the slashed cows bellowed and calves skidded in their mother's blood, when torches danced like black maidens and the milkmaids scattered and screeched before the barrels of the amicable brownings, that terrible night, old Eichbaum's daughter, Zilia, had run out into the yard, her blouse torn, and the king's victory turned into his downfall. Two days later, without warning, Benya gave back all the money that he had taken from Eichbaum, and then he came in the evening on a social call. He wore an orange suit, and underneath his cuff, a diamond bracelet sparkled. He entered the room, greeted Eichbaum, and asked him for the hand of his daughter, Zilia. The old man had a smile had a small stroke, but recovered. There were at least another 20 years of life in him. Listen, I, the king, told, the king told him, when you die, I'll have you buried in the first Jewish cemetery right by the gates. And I, um, I will have a monument of pink marble put up for you. I will make you the elder of the Brodsky Synagogue. I will give up my career, I, um, and I will go into business with you as a partner. We will have 200 cows, I, um, I will kill all the dairymen except you. No thief shall walk the street you live on. I shall build you a daka at the 16th stop. And don't forget, Eichbaum, you yourself were no rabbi in your youth. Who was it who forged that will? I think I'd better lower my voice, don't you? And your son-in-law will be the king. Not some snot face, the king, Eichbaum. And he got his way. That Ben Yacrick, because he was passionate, and passion holds sway over the universe. The newlyweds, stayed for three months in fertile <clears throat> Bessarabia among grapes, abundant food, and the sweat of love. When Benya returned to Odessa to marry off Devora, his 40-year-old sister, who was suffering from goiter, and now, having told the story of Sender Eichbaum, we can return to the marriage of Devora Krek, the king's sister. For the dinner at this wedding, they served turkeys, roasted chickens, geese, gefilte fish, and fish soup in which lakes of lemon shimmered like mother of pearl. Above the dead goose heads, flowers swayed like luxuriant plumes. But did the foamy, foamy waves of the Odessan Sea throw roasted chickens onto the shore? On this blue night, this starry night, the best of our contraband, everything from which our region <clears throat> is celebrated far and wide, plied its seductive, destructive craft. Wine from afar heated stomachs, sweetly numbed legs, dulled brains, and summoned belches as resonant as the call of battle horns. The black cook from the Plutarch, which had pulled in three days before from Port Said, had smuggled in big-bellied bottles of Jamaican rum, oily Madeira, cigars from the plantations of Pierpont Morgan, and oranges from the groves of Jerusalem. This is what the foamy waves of the Odessan Sea threw onto the shore, and this is what Odessan beggars sometimes get at Jewish weddings. They got Jamaican rum at Devorah Kirk's wedding, and that's why the Jewish beggars got as drunk as unkosher pigs and began loudly banging their crutches. Eichbaum unbuttoned his vest, mustered the raging crowd with a squinting eye, and hiccuped affectionately. 
the orchestra played a flourish. It was like a regimental parade. A flourish, nothing more than a flourish. The gangsters, sitting in closed ranks, were at first uneasy in the presence of outsiders, but soon they let themselves go. Leova Katsup smashed a bottle of vodka over his sweetheart's head. Monya artillerist fired shots into the air. But the peak of their ecstasy came when, in accordance with ancient custom, the guests began bestowing gifts on the newlyweds. The synagogue Shamasas jumped onto the table and sang out above the din of the seething flourishes, the quantity of rubles and silver spoons that were being presented. And here the friends of the king proved what blue blood was worth, and that Moldavanka chivalry was still in full bloom. With casual flicks of the hand, they threw gold coins, rings, and coral necklaces onto the golden trays. The Moldavanka aristocrats were jammed into crimson vests, their shoulders encased in chestnut-colored jackets, and their fleshy legs bulging in sky-blue leather boots. Drawing themselves up to their full height and sticking out their bellies, the bandits clapped to the rhythm of the music and shouted, Oi! A sweet kiss for the bride! Threw flowers at her, and she, 40-year-old Devorah, Benya Crick's sister, the sister of the king, deformed by illness, with her swollen goiter and eyes bulging out of their sockets, sat on a mountain of pillows next to a frail young man who was mute with melancholy, who'd been bought with Eichbaum's money. The gift-giving ceremony was coming to an end. The shamasas were growing hoarse, and the bass fiddle was clashing with the violin. A sudden, faint odor of burning spread over the courtyard. Benya, Papa Crick, the old carter, known as a ruffian, even in carting circles, shouted, Benya, you know what? I think the embers have blazed up again. Papa, the king said to his drunken father, Please eat and drink, and don't let these foolish things be worrying you. And Papa Crick followed his son's advice. He ate and drank. The cloud of smoke became ever more poisonous. Here and there, patches of sky were turning pink, and suddenly a tongue of fire, narrow as a sword, shot high into the air. The guests got up and started sniffing, and their women yelped. The gangsters looked at one another, and only Benya, who seemed not to notice anything, was inconsolable. My feast! They're ruining it, ruining it, he shouted in despair. My friends, please eat, drink. But at that moment, the same young man who had come at the beginning of the feast appeared again in the courtyard. King, he said, I have a couple of words I need to tell you. Well, speak, the king answered. You always got a couple of words up your sleeve. King, the young man said with a snigger. It's so funny. The police station's burning like a candle. The storekeepers were struck dumb. The gangsters grinned. Sixty-year-old Manka, matriarch of the Slobodka bandits, put two fingers in her mouth and whistled so shrilly that those sitting next to her jumped up. Manka, you're not at work now, Benya told her. Cool down. The young man who had brought this startling news was still shaking with laughter. About forty of them left the station to go on the raid, he said, his jaws quivering. They hadn't gone fifteen yards when everything went up in flames. Run and see for yourselves. But Benya forbade his guests to go look at the fire. He himself went with two friends. The police station was in flames. With their wobbling backsides, the policemen were running up and down the smoke-filled staircases, throwing boxes out of the windows. The prisoners made a run for it. The firemen were bristling with zeal, but it turned out that there wasn't any water in the nearby hydrant. The chief of police, the new broom so eager to sweep, stood on the opposite sidewalk, chewing on his mustache which hung into his mouth. The new broom stood completely still. Benya walked past and gave him a military salute. A very good day to you, Your Excellency, he said sympathetically. What bad luck, a nightmare. He stared at the burning building, shook his head and smacked his lips. Aye, aye, aye. When Benya came back home, the lantern lights in the courtyard were already going out and dawn was breaking across the sky. The guests had dispersed and the musicians were asleep their heads leaning against the necks of their bass fiddles. Only Devorah hadn't gone to sleep yet. With both hands, she was edging her timid husband towards the door of their nuptial chamber, looking at him lustfully like a cat, which, holding a mouse in its jaws, gently probes it with its teeth. That was The King by Isaac Babel. It's the first story in his collection of stories called Odessa Stories. It's his first uh, Odessa gangster story. Uh, Benya Crick makes many more appearances in that work. 
and I did say we would read two. Our second one is from the aforementioned Red Cavalry. Uh, this is titled A Letter. Here's a letter dictated to me by Kudyakov, a boy in our regiment. This letter deserves to be remembered. I wrote it down without embellishing it and am recording it here word for word as he said it. Dearest my mom, Edoikia Fyodorovna, I hasten in these first lines of my letter to set your mind at rest and to inform you that by the grace of the Lord I am alive and well, and that I hope to hear the same from you. I bow most deepest before you, touching the moist earth of my white forehead. There follows a list of relatives, godfathers and godmothers. I am omitting this. Let us proceed to the second paragraph. Dear Mama, Yudokia <clears throat> Fyodorovna Kuryakova, I hasten to inform you that I am in Comrade Budyoni's Red Cavalry Regiment, and that my godfather, Nikon Vasilik, is also here, and is at the present time a red hero. He took me and put me in his special detachment of the Polit El Tadel, in which we hand out books and newspapers to the various positions. The Moscow Zik, Izvestia, the Moscow Pravda, and our own <clears throat> merciless newspaper, the Krasny Cavalerist, which every fighter on the front wants to read, and then go and heroically hack the damn poles to pieces. And I am living real marvelous at Nikon Vasilix. Dearest Mama, Yudakoya Fyodorovna, send me anything that you possibly in any way can. I beg you to butcher our speckled pig and make a food packet for me. To be sent to Comrade Budyoni's po <clears throat> Politadel unit, addressed to Vasily Kudyakov. All evenings I go to sleep hungry and bitterly cold without any clothes at all. Write to me a letter about my, my Stepan. Is he alive or not? I beg you to look after him and to write to me about him. Is he still scratching himself, or has he stopped? And also about the scabs on his forelegs. Have you had him shod or not? I beg you, dearest Maman, <clears throat> Eudokia Fyodorovna, to wash without fail his forelegs with the soap I hid behind the icons. And if Papa has swiped it all, then buy some in Krasnodor, and the Lord will smile upon you. I must also describe that the country here is very poor. The musics with their horses hide in the woods from our red eagles, there's hardly no wheat to be seen. It's all scrawny, and we laugh and laugh at it. The people sow rye, and they sow oats, too. Hops grow on sticks here, so they come out very well. They brew some homebrew with them. In the second lines of this letter, I hasten to write to you about Papa. That he hacked my brother Fyodor Timofeyich Kurdyakov to pieces a year ago now. Our comrade Pavlachenko's Red Brigades attacked the town of Rostov when there was a betrayal in our ranks, and Papa was with the whites back then as commander of one of Denikin's companies. All the folks saw that Papa says he was covered in medals like with the old regiment, or old regime. And as we were betrayed, the whites captured us and threw us all in irons, and Papa caught sight of my brother, Fyodor Timofeyich. And Papa began hacking away at Fyodor, saying, you filthy, d you filth, you, you red dog, you son of a bitch and other things, and hacked away at him until sundown, until my brother Fyodor Timofeyich died. I'd started writing you a letter then, about how your Fyodor is lying buried without a cross, but Papa caught me, and he said you were your mother's bastards. I had to hear, I had to bear suffering like our Savior Jesus Christ. I managed to run away from Papa in the nick of time and join up with the Reds again. Comrade Pavlichenko's company and our brigade got the order to go to the town of Varanez to get more men. And we got more men and horses too, bags, revolvers, and everything we needed. About Varanez, beloved Mama, Edokia Fyodorovna, I can describe that it is indeed a marvelous town, a bit larger, I think, than Krasnodor. The people in it are very beautiful. The river is brilliant to the point of being able to swim. We were given two pounds of bread a day each, half a pound of meat, and sugar enough so that when you got up, you drank sweet tea, and the same in the evenings, for getting hunger. And for dinner, I went to my brother Semyon Timofich for blini or goose meat, and then lay down to rest. 
At the time, the whole regiment wanted to have Simeon Timofich for a commander, because he is a wild one. And that order came from Comrade Budioni, and Simeon Timofich was given two horses, good clothes, a cart, especially for rags he's looted, and a, and a red flag medal. And they really looked up to me as I am his brother. Now, when some neighbor offends you, then Simeon Timofich can completely slash him to pieces. Then we start chasing General Denikin, slash them down by the thousands and chase them to the Black Sea. But Papa was nowhere to be seen. And Semyon Temefich looked for him in all the positions because he mourned for our brother Fyodor. But only, dearest Mama, since you know Papa and his stubborn character, do you, do you know what he did? He impudently painted his red beard black and was in the town of makeup in civilian clothes so that nobody there knew that he is he himself, that very same police constable of the old regime. But truth will always show in the end. My godfather, Nikon Vasilik, saw him by chance in the hut of a townsman and wrote my brother Simon Timofich a letter. We got on horses and galloped 200 versts, me, my brother Simeon, and boys who wanted to come along from the Cossack village. And what is it we saw in the town of Makeup? We saw that people away from the front, they don't give a damn about the front. And it's all full of betrayal and yids like in the old regime. And my brother Semyon Timofich in the town of Makeup had a good row with the yids who would not give Papa up and had thrown him in jail under lock and key, saying that a decree had come not to hack to pieces prisoners. We'll try him ourselves, don't be angry. He'll get what he deserves. But then Semyon Timofich spoke and proved that he was the commander of a regiment and had been given all the medals of the red flag by Karmad Budjani, and threatened to hack to pieces everyone who argued over Papa's person without handing him over. And the boys from the Cossack villages threatened them too. But then, the moment Semyon got hold of Papa, Semyon began whipping him, and lined up all the fighters in the yard as befits military orders. And then Semyon splashed water all over Papa's beard, and the color flowed from the beard. And Semyon asked our Papa, Timofey Radoyanich, So, Papa... Are you feeling good now that you're in my hands? No, Papa said. I'm feeling bad. And Simeon asked him, And my brother Fyodor, when you were hacking him to pieces, did he feel good in your hands? No, Papa said. Fyodor was feeling bad. And Simeon asked him, And did you think, Papa, that someday you might be feeling bad? No, Papa said. I didn't think that I might be feeling bad. Then Semyon turned to the people and said, And I believe, Papa, that if I fell into your hands, I would find no mercy. So now, Papa, we will finish you off. Timofey Vardoyanvich began impudently cursing Semyon, my mama and the mother of God, and slapping Semyon in the face. And Simeon sent me out of the yard so that I, I cannot, dearest Mama, you'd <clears throat> describe to you how they finished off Papa because I had been sent out of the yard. After that, we stopped at the town <clears throat> of Novorossik. Novorossik. About that town, one can say that there isn't a single bit dry anywhere anymore. Just water, the Black Sea. And we stayed there right until May. And then we set off for the Polish front where we were slapping the Polish masters about in full swing. I remain your loving son, Vasily Tomeyevich Kordyakov. Mama, look in on Stepan, and the Lord will smile upon you. This is Kordyakov's letter without a single word changed. When I'd finished, he took the letter and hit it against the naked flesh of his chest. Kordyakov, I asked the boy, was your father a bad man? My father was a dog, he answered sullenly. And your mother? My mother's good enough. Here's my family if you want to take a look. He held out a tattered photograph. It was in, or in it was Timofey Kordyakov, a wide-shouldered police constable in a policeman's cap, his beard neatly combed. He was stiff with wide cheekbones and sparkling, colorless, vacant eyes. Next to him in a bamboo chair sat a tiny peasant woman in a loose blouse with small, bright, timid features. And against this 
provincial photographer's pitiful backdrop with its flowers and doves, towered two boys, amazingly big, blunt, broad-faced, goggle-eyed, and frozen as if standing in attention. The Kurdyakov brothers, Fyodor and Semyon. That was a letter by Isaac Babel from Red Cavalry. So, I uh, hope you have enjoyed this uh, little digression from I guess, what we normally would have done. Um, if you uh, liked it, please let us know. Give us a comment. Um, and I hope to see you next time.